Hey everyone, this amazing ESO Network show is brought to you by our fine sponsor, Amazon.com. Please remember to shop Amazon for all your geeky needs, no matter what time of the year it is. All you need to do is go to ESOPodcast.com slash ESO Amazon, or click on the Amazon banner on the ESO Network webpage to go to our e-store. It's the best way to shop and the best way to support this program, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Okay, that's enough of me babbling for now. Now on with your regular scheduled show. You gotta ask yourself one question, punk. What the hell is a cigar nerd? Welcome to the Cigar Nerds Podcast. It's the only show where two guys smoke cigars and talk about nerd culture. Do you like movies, games, comics, sci-fi, pop culture, and beer? Do you like science, nerd news, explosions for no apparent reason? Then this is the show for you. It's like being in a nerdy cigar shop, but for your ears. Check us out at CigarNerdPodcast.com. Hello, and welcome again to the Monster Sci-Fi Show Podcast. I am your host, the Monster... Happy belated Father's Day to all the fathers that listen to this show. All three of you. (laughs) So, here I am, Monday night. I could not get this episode done before last Friday. Because, again, I was working. And this weekend I was off with the kids. And yesterday was Father's Day. So now, being Monday night, the kids are staying over at the in-laws. My wife, who's dealing with um, a bad tooth, went to the dentist and going to get root canal. So right now she's kind of knocked out with pain medication. So I'm in my happy place. I have the house to myself. And I'm watching... Star Trek Enterprise Season 3 of all the things that I could watch. Well, technically, I kind of started this on the weekend. I was kind of bored and I just wanted to see something that was decent enough. And again, Enterprise is not great. It had its moments. To me, Season 3 was probably one of the better options aside from Season 4, which... If you're a Star Trek fan, Manny Cotto, who came in to do uh, the executive producing for that season, threw in lots of fan favorite uh, items that I'm just like, I just was floored by it. So, except for the last episode, that was just horrendous. Nonetheless, I've been really extremely busy, and I'm going to talk about one of the reasons why I've been extremely busy, and... This is the reason why I actually canceled the Sci-Fi Book Club for this month, which was going to be on Dune. So, but let's talk about a couple of Batman items, and then I'll go into my last thing about what's making me so damn busy. So, last week, uh, rather the week before last week, when I posted the last Sci-Fi News podcast... Adam West had just passed away. So he had died at the age of 88. And he had died um, dealing with leukemia. So he didn't have a very long battle. But again, because of his age and this disease, unfortunately, it's not something that... It didn't work out in his favor. But nonetheless, I remember watching back in New York... Channel 11, WPIX, was my favorite channel in which they would do Batman reruns. And this is the Adam West version. There was something very fun to watch a half hour episode, or rather an hour episode, because basically it was just a two-parter. And watching Adam West just be a very straight-laced Batman, but because he was very, what's the word? 
because his humor was very dry, I kind of picked up on his subtleties, his nuances. At, at one point, you know, Robin is really excited about uh, something that's going to happen. And in that moment, while he's Batman is also ready to go to battle, he took time to correct Robin's grammar. <laughs> it's like, despite all this, grammar still matters. And I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. Of all of this, he's still doing grammar matters. So aside from all the gadgets, and of course, don't forget, we had the, the TV, not the TV movie, it was actually the Batman movie, in which, of course, we get the legendary shark and the shark, the bat shark repellent in the very beginning. And, uh, yeah, it, you could not get any more campier than that. Or, my favorite, when Batman broke out the bat shield and there's this, this weird plexiglass thing that he would fold up tuck it behind his back underneath his cape and voila it was gone it was tucked away and I'm like that's impossible but still it was a lot of fun to watch this and of course we had a great cast of villains like Vincent Price who was Egghead Frank Gorshin the Riddler Eartha Kitt and Julie Newmar and Lee Merriweather as all cat women, cat women, cat women's, women's, whatever. <laughs> Nonetheless, I am sad that this has happened, but again, he's had a very long career and he still has even more stuff that's coming out. If you are a fan of Powerless, DC has released an episode in which. There was a cameo of Adam West, which I'm glad they did. That was fantastic. So thank you to DC for doing that. Again, a very short-lived series. It could have been even better, but nonetheless, we have at least one moment that you can watch right now. I have not watched the animated The Return of the Dyna- Dynamic Duo, which came out in 2016. But the sequel is coming up, in which Batman, played by Adam West, is going to be fighting Two-Face. And who's Two-Face? Our very favorite (laughs) Captain William Shatner. So, that is going to be something I am now really looking forward to. And I think to kind of sum up the whole feeling about the passing of Adam West, the most touching tribute, and again, very simple, but a powerful statement, was having the bad signal being shown against a building, I think it was City Hall, Los Angeles, so sorry if I don't know, know the location, but nonetheless, that is a, such a beautiful thing, I was truly amazed by that. It would have been better if it was going against the clouds and then and do that. But still, this was really cool. You don't really see that too often. Sure, the Empire State Building may do different colors uh, in memory of certain things or to highlight uh, special holidays like going all green for like St. Patrick's Day or red, white, and blue for the 4th of July. But seeing that symbol... That I grew up with. That is amazing. Moving on to another Batman side story. 20 years later. If you've ever watched Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin. Guess what? He owes you an apology. And he gave it to you. So... He gave an interview in which he went on and on and on about how he's taking responsibility for really <laughs> giving us this kind of crappy movie. Now, kind of moving off from Tim Burton, because it's the 25th anniversary of 
Batman Returns, and that's the one with Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman and Danny DeVito as the Penguin. Because he was not going to be coming back, Tim Burton uh, just moved on to other things. So Joe Schumacher came in and basically gave us, and I kind of refer to this and I guess other people too, but the movie Batman Forever gave us kind of like a living comic book. It was full of color everywhere. It was just nonstop eye candy. Uh, not so much in the way of special effects, but just the, the color palette, just everywhere, which is truly astounding. Now, a couple of things that I wasn't crazy about. You had Harvey Dent, played by Tommy Lee Jones, it was acting more like a Joker instead of the Harvey Dent that we got to see later on in the Christopher Nolan movies. The spotlight that really won for me was Jim Carrey as the Riddler. So, very cool, very happy with that. I wasn't crazy about Val Kilmer being in the suit, only because it just seems that the suit really punctuated his lips even more so. Aside from that, there were some scenes like the Batmobile... Going up outside of a building. For what reason? I don't know. But we never get to see it coming back down. So it's not Tim Burton. It is not as dark. It is the 180. Complete opposite of that genre. So it did very well in the box office. And then we get the sequel. Now in Batman Forever we do get a Robin. And in this one... He is now part of the title. But wait, there's more. We're going to get Batgirl. And the villains, we got Mr. Freeze, at, uh, played by Schwarzenegger. We get Poison Ivy by Uma Thurman. And her sidekick, or her minion, Bane. And of course, Val Kilmer left the project before I started filming to do the island of Dr. Morell. Why? Of course, Marlon Brando was in it. That's why. <laughs> who you got to replace? We got George Clooney, who is still running high from his ER fame on TV. But the problem lies is that every time they put on a costume, they do these, these extreme close-ups of, like, the glove is being inserted into the glove, or the cape is being spun around the neck, or you get to see bat ass crack, or the bat nipple, or it just get really, really dumb. So, the, the novelty of the living comic book movie became almost a joke, and even I forgot the actor who played um, Robin, talked about he felt after making the first movie that it really felt like a movie whereas the second one felt like all we're doing is just making toys and that's exactly what's happening so go back to Batman Returns the problem lies is that because that movie was completely dark darker in some people's minds than the original one There was, I guess, not an outrage, but there was a concern that they wanted to have a more family-friendly Batman movie. Hence why we got this completely different color scheme and why Batman and Robin put in so much stuff in there. Because basically that's what it was. It was just pushing merchandising. Because when Batman Forever came out, Warner Brothers did amazingly with their licensing product. So, let's do this again. So they got the exact same director and did it even more again. So, in hindsight, you know, Joel Schumacher, after the movie was done, took stock about what he has done and what he always had wanted to do. He wanted to be in the business 
and look where he ended up as. From that point on, his name was mud in in the circles of Hollywood because basically you took this franchise and you just went completely ballistic. I mean, it was at times as campy as the original Batman series with Adam West. But the problem lied, it wasn't that good. You gave all these one-liners to Schwarzenegger doing Mr. Freeze. Everybody chill. Or, you know, hasta la, uh, uh, whatever. I'm not going to even get into that anymore. Or the fact that Bane was this weird, cartoonish character. Yes, he had the kind of look that you saw in the comics, but it just looked cheap. It was really repugnant. And even when there was rumors about, oh, they're going to remake Batman or do another Batman movie, it's like, well, why? They really ruined this. Thankfully, Christopher Nolan gave us the kind of Batman movie that many of us had wanted. Now, to go back to the thing with Adam West, there are very few characters that allow you to kind of make fun of that character. They're part of the joke. You can't do that with everyone. Superman, you can't do humor like that. Now, when in its heyday, Uh, The Batman version with Adam West was really big. They tried to do that with Wonder Woman. And if you look at the pilot, it is god-awful. They tried to make it seem like the the Wonder Woman who's being played on the screen is this delusional woman who thinks she's the the end and be-all of beauty, and she's not. But then they just made that character look dumb. So the problem lies is that it's again, if you talk about you want to be part of the joke, not be the joke. Batman and Robin, with Adam West and Bird Ward, they were part of it. They understood it and they played it well. But you can't do that with every character. Sure, you can say, well, you have Deadpool who does a lot of wink to, you know, to the audience. But that's kind of the, not the exact same thing. He is purposely talking to you, whereas Batman as Adam West, you're part of that. And you didn't need to kind of break the fourth wall. You didn't need to do that. This is the rare situation in which Batman can be played with lots of humor, like the animated series, The Brave and the Bold, which I love. Or you can do Batman the Animated Series, which is the complete opposite, which is the more darker version. But the whole noir... Really? Thanks, Mr. Speed Racer. (laughs) So, you can play the whole film noir version of Batman in the Animated Series. Which was perfect. There's something to be said for both situations... But again, Batman is the the rare combination of doing something that's camp and of doing something that's serious. I doubt we'll ever will get to see both happen, but nonetheless, I'm I'm happy that what we got from Adam West still survives today, and there was great demand for that DVD to come out, and finally it did. And we're getting two movies, or at least one is already out for the animated uh, Batman. And then another one next... Actually, later this year, we're going to get the second uh, movie with uh, Shatner. But with, again, going back to Joel Schumacher, I was done with Batman at that point because Bane at that time was huge. If you know the Nightfall series from the comics... Bane broke Batman. Literally and figuratively broke Batman. When you have the the Doomsday Super, Superman storyline in which he was killed, 
So what do they do with Batman? They give him Nightline, Nightline. They gave him Nightfall and Bane. So you you have this incredible, unstoppable force going against Batman, and then you bring that to the big screen, and it's it's like a luchador wrestler that's so badly done, and I really hated what they did with that character. Thankfully, we do get a Bane that is better than the last of the trilogies that Christopher Nolan did. So, but yeah, I'm glad that he at least acknowledges that it was a bad move. But, you know, it it was a very long time ago. And, uh, yeah, I don't think I would want to watch it again. I only maybe in passing with the kids I was like see kids see what I had to go through I'm showing this to you so you know the difference something that's good and something that's bad and this is horrendous (laughs) so so going from one Batman to another Batman so it was kind of B and B I'm now going to talk about what's kept me busy this week is something called D&D. You see how I transitioned into that? D&D. Dungeons and Dragons. That's what I've been doing. Let me tell you. I was freaking out. Even up to the very night before I had that event at my library. But before I do that, let me tell you my limited experience with Role playing. So a bunch of us, when we were working at Borders Bookshop, it was sometime late August. I forget the year, but it's the year that, or the day of, O.J. Simpson was in that f- famous Bronco chase by the police. So we went to a friend's house. They put on TV, and we were chosen to get our characters together, but we were so focused on watching O.J. Simpson in the Bronco. But the next time we got to play, uh, I think it was an Ugnaught, because we were doing a Star Wars version of this. So we had a mission to retrieve some kind of box, and in the box was some kind of special flower. And after a while, I was just like, really? We played hours, and that's, that's it. We completed the mission. So I'm like, I'm going to start backstabbing people. So, in the elevator, I start throwing my knives and start killing people. But the DM, super uber geeky, nerdy, ruined it all. He forced, loved all of us by throwing whatever dice. So, it prevented us from attacking each other and ended the game. So... Effectively, that was the last time I got to play any type of role-playing game a la Dungeons & Dragons. So, I've always wanted to play something like that. There was Magic the Gathering, so I used to do the card game, and I spun that off into Star Trek Next Generation and played the card customizable card game. And then I think there was... The werewolf card. So there was tons and tons and tons of these card games. But again, it's it wasn't the same like Dungeons and Dragons. So all these years, many decades later, here I am. The week before I got to um, do this, last Wednesday, I'm freaking out because, again, I'm the dungeon master... I don't know what to expect. I have an idea in my head as to how the gameplay is going to start. So I'm doing research, I'm watching videos, and I'm I'm trying to learn everything that I can. And basically, I'm like, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. But the premise was is that I had in my head uh, a scenario in which whatever people were there, whatever people wanted to play with, they were just washed up on a beach. And basically, there would be encounters along the way. And on the other side, 
of this island, there would be one boat, but enough for one person to get off the island. So the idea was through the encounters, more than likely they would be taking losses in casualties. So I would lose maybe half the party, and by the time they get to the boat, whatever survivors I had, they would have to battle each other, and then the winner would take the boat. So that was my in my head what I was planning to do. So there was a site that I came across to do a map. Because I wanted to kind of keep it simple enough so that visually, if you never played Dungeons and Dragons, you can see where things are and um, and have the little one inch box also be mapped over the terrain so you would know where to move in relation to the uh, terrain so there was this um, map that he, this person did that was for free so I was able to download it and print it in color of a rocky beach shore so basically if you can imagine left you have a cluster of rocks and then you had uh, on the right also another cluster but in between you had like this kind of winding river mouth basically leading out into the sea so i had both uh i had the parties broke it broke up into two groups so both of them were opposite of each other but they could see each other so through the gameplay one of them one of <laughs> going out into sea and had to swim back and then we got to the point when we finally got into an encounter which was with a dire wolf so if you go to my Instagram page, you'll see the direwolf character that I did 3D printing of. So I broke that character out, and it didn't attack at first. But eventually, it started crying out to whoever or whatever. So that started worrying the people. So they wound up attacking the direwolf, even though the direwolf was there, didn't do anything. And then... After a couple of rounds, all of a sudden, we get another character who is with a crossbow saying, Who shot my pet? Of course, everyone pointed to the person who was able to shoot. So I started to shoot that person. That failed. So then they started to attack the owner. The owner wound up being dead. But before the owner died, the owner whistled. A command to the dire wolf to start to attack <laughs> so that's how things ended because I was able to kill one of the players and by basically just ripping out his neck and just like let him bleed to death but all the while the closest player to him he kept trying to throw magic and he was just like sparkly glowy nothing would work because he would just roll such a bad roll like really bad like like under five with his d20 so finally took him out so within the two hours that we started the gameplay we were still on this one map and i'm like i got two other sections plus a third one that was going to be without a map because i figured as the characters move and then they'll progress to a certain point they will go inside a place in which it will be very barely lit, but then they would have to use their imagination as to how they're going to map out what they're doing. So I would have a separate map, and I would tell them, well, to the left is so-and-so. To the right, you have 30 feet in front of you before you hit a wall or something to that effect. So then all the initial visual maps will be kind of helpful for them to understand where they are where they are to each other or how things are being moved within the story so before we even got off the first map we had to end the gameplay because the, the event was over so what got me excited was like because the night before i thought about that scenario i thought about there's a dire wolf and the owner came so before they started attacking, or just about when they were attacking, the owner 
uh, will give them information say my dire wolf smelled you when you came onto the island he's protecting this island and I would want to take you back to the village to help you rest and recover because we saw the boat that was shipwrecked or went down in the ocean that was what's going to happen but because the owner is now dead and the dire wolf has been ordered to start attacking by the time everything goes around there's going to be major consequences as to what happened so when all is said and done I freaking loved playing Dungeons and Dragons even though we haven't played anything with any dungeons or even dragons we just had our characters and they were fighting against a dire wolf and its owner with a crossbow and one of the videos I remember watching about uh, being a first time DM he said that as long as the players enjoyed themselves and had fun then you had fun and that was true so what lucked out in my favor is that the night before or two nights before if you are looking at my uh, pictures that I post for um, the cover for the podcast you'll see the actual graphic for the podcast that, that's the very top and you see the dragon breathing fire that graphic is on a TV that's playing on a loop so when I saw that I was blown away by it it is so much better than the normal poster that I have for Dungeons and Dragons but seeing that beautiful dragon with that fire oh my god it was fantastic so it got interest so I was able to talk to one of the teens who was there with his mom and he talked to me about his dad who used to play with this Dungeons and Dragons as a kid and that he might be interested in coming and then later on that afternoon the dad came out came out of work I spoke to the dad and told him about what we were planning to do so he came the day of and we got to play with him and his two kids and then two other staff members joined in and I was the DM so for those two hours I had a great time because they had a great time so all the work and all the preparation that I had in my head didn't really matter much I don't know everything about how to cast certain spells I knew the basic mechanics that if I'm going to roll a certain die, which is the d20, if I hit the character high enough against the armor class, like say if it was a 13 and I roll a 14, then I have a hit. And then I get to roll a different die that's going to be smaller, and that's going to be the amount of damage that I can do to that character as far as hit points. And that's basically it. But base the but even before we get to that point, I had an idea in my head as to what the story would be. From that point on, it's not up to me. It's them reacting to the story, and as each one is taking their turn, the story is changing. So by the time it comes back to me, I have to respond accordingly or improvise in a way that I can still play my story hence why there was going to be a point in which there was going to be a battle but not to the point that someone was, go was going to die but that's okay because as the story will continue in a couple of weeks actually almost not from almost a month now because they're going on vacation so when I play this game next week I'll do it hopefully with new people and I'll do something different but when that picks up again, that campaign that I just made up, they're going to be in trouble. <laughs> so, because once they get to the village, they realize, oh, you killed my daughter, prepare to die, that kind of whole thing. So they wind up throwing them into prison. And that's where we're going. And that's where we're going to get the dungeon part. So, 
that's when it got really exciting to me. And of course, when I watched E3, and this has nothing to do with it, but it was a funny thing. I started to watch E3 because that'll be the next podcast. And I did the whole Microsoft hour and a half or two hours, whatever it was. And as much as like, okay, this is kind of cool. I like the ideas, what they're doing. There was no way any video game could have ever captured the amount of fun with multiple people. There was no way vividly in my head and I'm sure their version in their heads, all the players saw the story differently. But it was such an amazing moment that you're never going to get that feeling. Sure, graphic-wise and gameplay-wise, and then if you play with other people, sure, you may have great enjoyment. But there's something about the collective experience with people interacting with them socially in person and it was nothing more than me looking at the person across me or to the left of me or to the right of me and asking what do you want to do that's it you tell a story you react what do you want to do roll your dice based on that roll you did Yes, you can do that. No, you can't do that. If you can do that, let's see what is going to happen next. So the dice really plays an important part of this. But it's really the players and and the, the interaction with each other. I think that it is so amazing that you can't really get a sense about what it feels like unless you played it yourself. When I see, like, when we do um, game tournaments and do Smash Brothers, we talk about how every time we try pictures for promotion, it, it, yeah, they have the controllers and they're looking at the screen and people are cheering left and right, but it's not the exact same thing that if you do that for Dungeons and Dragons moment. And you get players that are really into it and are, are in the moment and are starting to act out their characters or what they're doing with their actions, then that's a little bit more visually stunning. Because I found myself really almost coming out of my own shell because I'm not that person that is going to be, hey, you know, I'm going to rip your, your head apart. And, but after a while, I'm almost starting to get into the moment because I was just getting caught up with the story. And this is just, again, a very easy, peasy, lemon, squeezy story that I just made up. Eventually, I'll do a campaign from a book that I can just read and then that will help. But it was fun doing something on the fly and having an idea of Okay, at this point, something should happen. Let's see what happens. And it was great. It was really great. So, this is why I've been busy. I've been trying to focus on... I've been trying to focus on so many different elements to make this work. I went to Tate's, which is a comic book store up in Lauder Hill. And I bought bags of dice. I bought little characters. I bought a map. I even spent money on buying wet erase markers because of the the type of map that I have. But I didn't even get to do that because I was able to print out an actual map that fit on the map itself. But it was looking so much better in color rather than me drawing it. They looked fantastic. I was just like... Again, if you go to my Instagram page, you'll see the pictures on there, and it looks fantastic. So, I really can't wait to play this again. So, 
and this is the reason why I'm behind on a lot of things. Because, again, I want to put in a lot of good hard work behind what I do at the library. And because this is such a low-tech option, there's so many details. There's so many books. There's a DM book, a player's handbook, and a monster manual. And then there's updated versions of all that. (laughs) So, it's just a matter of finding out what works for you and then kind of hodgepodging the story as it goes along. And it it was fun. And I can't wait to do this as a Star Wars story or a Star Trek story or even Firefly. I think visually uh, and I probably get to that point in which I will do a video of an actual gameplay at the library. And hopefully if that will encourage you to do gameplay like this and and bring back something that is far beyond anything that I've ever had experienced. Yes, I enjoyed it many, many, many years ago, but there's such a resurgence to go something that's low-tech. And for the summer, I thought it was the perfect thing to do to get kids who've never played something like this for them who for what they only know is going to be just video games and because of Stranger Things there's kind of a resurgence of going back to the basics of simple games that you can play with each other you don't worry about having to be online with your Xbox and like with me with Battlefront Every time I log in and try to play with others, I get shot in the head immediately. Nothing is worse and more frustrating than being shot by someone you don't even know who they are. I can't even talk smack because I'm I'm already dead. And there are certain moments in which, oh, this is kind of cool. Like in Forza, I can play with my cousin Ralph and we're racing together. That's kind of cool because he's up in New York and I'm here in in Miami. That's awesome. But if you're able to get people in the exact same room, that blows anything else, anything else away. Seriously. If you have not tried Dungeons and Dragons, I encourage you. Do something really fun this, this summer. Do it with your friends. Do it with your family. You will not regret this. So I'm waiting for that time in which I get to play with my family. Because we've been talking about it. And now that I've done it for at least one time. I'm like, sure, I can do this now. I will teach you all. Because I am the dungeon master. So. Alright, so that's enough of me yammering. So, again, that was the highlight for our, that was the highlight for me for this week, aside from being Father's Day and all that. But honestly, what an incredible professional and geeky high that was to be a dungeon master for the first time. So, if you've played this before, please, I would love to hear your ideas, your best practices, because again, I want to get better at this. So, and if you want to pick my brains, I'll tell you what I know. Not that it's going to be much, but I'll tell you everything that I know. All right, so, again, my apologies for being late, but it's a very good damn reason why I'm late because of Dungeons and Dragons. Ah, I can't. God, I really want to play right now. I really, really do. So, and that's the other thing, too. When I get stuck on things and try to go to bed, I start thinking about different scenarios. And I cannot stop thinking about that. And then somehow my head or I'm I'm rolling dice. Even though I don't see it, I know in my head I'm rolling dice in my dreams. So it's in my blood. (laughs) So any case, I got to go. I need to edit this. I need to put it out there in a verse. So like I said, if you want... Go find my Instagram page, Monster Sci-Fi Show Podcast is there. 
I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. You can find me again on the various social networks. Just search me by Monster Sci Fi Show. Email me, Monster Sci Fi Show at gmail.com. Seriously, folks, I want to hear from you. And also, please, if you're listening to this, go to my show notes. Take click on the the survey. Please do that for me so I can start getting advertisers to this podcast again. I want to grow this podcast, and I want this to be because of you. So please take a moment to do so. So, again, thank you very much for listening to me and to the Monster Sci-Fi Show podcast. Sci-Fi, from a certain point of view. Good night. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network, your station for all things geek, classic, current, and beyond. Be part of the crew at esonetwork.com.